Hello, today we're going to go over chapter 9, which focuses on capital budgeting and cost of capital. We're going to go over a very brief review of time value of money, focusing on using Excel to compute time value of money problems. In addition to that, we're going to look into different factors that affect the cost of capital, particularly factors that are unique to entrepreneurs who are not able, oftentimes not able to hold well diversified portfolios that a typical investors can do. And then lastly, we're going to go over capital budgeting methods and once again use Excel to conduct capital budgeting analysis. We assume that you have some basic knowledge of time value of money and the discussion here focuses on using Excel as a tool to help you compute time value of money. Here are the uh, functions that we have in Excel that will enable you to compute the future value, present value, payment, interest rate and number of time period and also net present value. If you have experiences with time value of money using other methods such as a financial calculator, the translation into Excel is relatively straightforward. Uh, the Excel functions in, um, make the same inflow outflow assumption. So when, for example, when we are solving for interest rate, Excel assumes that either you have uh, your future value is an inflow and your present value is an outflow or vice versa. If you do not conform to this um, assumption in Excel, you end up with an error. And uh, we'll go over some examples and you'll get a chance to try that out. Another thing that I want to point out is the time, uh, the cash flow timing assumption in Excel's NPV function. The NPV function in Excel computes the net present value for a series of uneven cash flows. It, however, it assumes that the first cash flows occur in t equals 1. So if you have cash flow in year 0 and you include that in the NPV function, you'll end up with the wrong answer. So here are just a few overview. Again, we're going to practice all of this. For the cost of capital, first I'm going to uh, review some of the basic principle of cost of capital for a publicly traded company and then we'll focus on what makes an entrepreneur situation unique. The most important factor that affects the cost of capital is risk. So for a publicly traded company, we can distinguish risk into several types. First are the business risks. Business risks are affected by the cyclical nature of the service or the product of the company, the competitive environment, and the cost structure. So typically a luxury good will be more susceptible to cyclical changes and therefore they'll have a higher business risk. So in other words, when times are bad, people will buy fewer luxury goods and when times are good, people will, will buy more luxury goods. Um, Essential commodities are, have less business risk because people will need to consume those commodities such as um, basic food. Um, and then also cost structure, a uh, an industry that requires a high fixed cost component will tend to have a higher business risk because they'll have to uh, continue to pay the high fixed cost regardless of the business um, environment. The second component to the risk is financial risk. Financial risk has to do with how much leverage, how much debt a company takes on. And then when we look at the stockholder who are the equity holders, equity risks include both financial and business risk. So for the risk for a publicly traded firms assumes that investors are well diversified. There are two very common models that we use to estimate cost of equity for a publicly traded firm. The first is called the dividend growth model. This model is appropriate for companies that pay dividends. And the required return here, again, this is this um, videos are meant to be a highlight from the book. So the abbreviations and the derivation of this model is explained in much more detail in the textbook. So R here is the uh, cost or the return on equity and D1 stands for dividend in year one, P0 stands for price in year zero, plus G here, G stands for the dividend growth rate. So again, this is a summary highlight. Um, and then the second model is called the capital asset pricing model. 
The capital pricing pricing uh, the capital asset pricing model or CAPM states that the required return on equity is equal to RF, which is the risk free rate. Beta is the systematic risk of the stock, and RM is the return on the market, and RF again is the risk free rate. The difference between the market return and the risk free rate is called the market risk premium. So the cost of equity for a firm depends on a number of things. It depends on uh, its systematic risk, the market uh, required return on the stock market, and also the risk-free rate. It also depends on the current stock price, which ultimately is affected by the market, and the growth rate. So depending on which model you decided to use. Now let's turn to from a public company to a private company. Uh, for a private company, a lot of the information that um, is available for a public company is not available because a private company is not traded continuously on a stock exchange. So its market price is not available. That makes the dividend growth model not applicable because the first term in the dividend growth model is dividend yield, which requires you to divide the dividend by the price. And if a private company is not traded, then we don't have a um, up-to-date price for the company. The second model, capital asset pricing model, is also difficult to apply to a private company directly because a private company, once again, because it's not traded, we don't have a stock price and therefore we cannot estimate its systematic risk directly. However, we could find a way to estimate the systematic risk indirectly. And here are the step-by-step -step approach. Again, this is the highlight from what is discussed in the textbook. You do need to read the textbook too, um, especially if you have not seen these concepts before to get a more detailed explanation of the uh, steps and the assumptions behind um, these adjustments. So the first step in estimating the cost of equity for a private company is to estimate its unlevered cost of equity. And we can do that we start with finding the cost of equity for a public company that is in the same industry or in the same business. Next, we adjust for financial leverage. So what we do here is we take the cost of equity for the public firm, and then we take out the leverage component for that particular company. Let's take a look at the capital asset pricing model. There is a precise relationship between unlever and lever beta. The unlever beta is equal to lever beta divided by this term here. So what we, what we do is we estimate the beta for a public firm. And by definition, most firms have depth, so the beta you estimated is the lever beta. And we adjust the lever beta by the tax rate of the public firm and the debt to equity ratio of the public firm. From that, we get the unlevered beta. And once you have the unlevered beta, you can use it to estimate the unlevered cost of equity. If you have a dividend growth model, the adjustment for financial risk is less precise. And basically, it relies on some form of ad hoc method. For example, you can estimate the difference between the company's risky bond versus the risk-free rate. And that represents the um, risk of financial leverage for the firm. And your unlevered cost of equity will be the cost of capital for the public firm minus this adjustment. So this um, um, risky bond premium that um, you, uh, that you identify. So either approach will give you an estimate. So this is for a, uh, for a private company. Another important um, characteristic of a private company is that because its shares are not traded, it is illiquid. It's difficult to cash out of investment in a private company. So you look at an entrepreneur, um, that this, this adds two additional dynamics. First of all, it um, for many entrepreneurs, they invest most of their wealth into the business. And if the world is perfect in a perfect market, then entrepreneurs can 
uh, cash out anytime they want. But we know that the, the capital market is not perfect and there are frictions and therefore entrepreneurs most of the time cannot get all the money they need and therefore they become under diversified. So they're investing more of their, um, their wealth into their own business than a well diversified investors would. As we mentioned, because the company is private, is not liquid, and therefore we need two additional adjustments after we compute the unlevered cost of capital. So what we need to do is to add the risk premium back to the unlevered cost of equity that we computed um, in the last step. First is to adjust for the financial premium of the firm. Um, so here, uh, the financial premium is equal to the lever beta. Here, the lever beta is the lever beta computed using the debt to equity ratio of the private company that we are estimating. And the difference between the two times the market risk premium, remember the market return minus the risk free, risk -free rate is the market risk premium that give us the financial risk premium. Next, we need to add illiquidity premium. And the textbook um, go over a brief summary of um, studies that um, academics have conducted. And a meta-analysis of those study revealed that the illiquidity premium averaged between 3% to 6% in the United States. And finally, because the entrepreneurs are under diversified and because of this under diversification, we need to add in unsystematic risk premium. This premium will not be relevant for an investor who holds a well diversified portfolio in a public company. And a investor who, um, if he or she chooses to hold an under diversified portfolio will not be rewarded. However, for an entrepreneur, that's not the case because entrepreneur due to imperfection in the market have no choice but to be under diversified. So the entrepreneur will demand a risk premium for the unsystematic risk that she has to bear. And that's equal to the lever beta times the unsystematic risk adjustment factor times the market risk premium. Uh, Professor DeModeran has done a lot of study on unsystematic risk adjustment factor. And in the appendix in the, in the, ta in the textbook, we listed the unsystematic risk adjustment factors for um, the major industries in the United States. Finally, the cost of equity is equal to the unlevered cost of capital that we computed um, in the last step, plus the financial risk premium, plus the illiquidity premium, which is between 3% to 6%, plus the unsystematic risk premium. The textbook go over a step-by-step -step calculation on how we derive a um, the cost of capital for a private firm. And you'll have a chance to practice that in an exercise, and you'll also have a chance to practice this in a case study. Next, if a company uses um, debt in its capital structure, then we may also need to compute the weighted average cost of capital. Here, the steps for computing uh, the weighted average cost of capital for a private firm is the same as that for a public firm. Uh, the only difference is the cost of equity that you use has to follow the steps that we just described. So, the weighted average cost of capital is computed as the weight of equity times the cost of equity plus the weight of debt times the cost, cost of debt times one minus the tax rate. We multiply it by uh, cost of debt by one minus the tax rate because interest on debt is tax deductible. And the cost of debt is the cost of borrowing. So this, for a private firm, that will be uh, most uh, there will be a bank loan that they can take out or a line of credit that they can um, access. Now that you have the cost of capital, you have a major component of the capital budgeting um, 
method requirements. Uh, to put this into practice, in addition to knowing the cost, in this case, this case cost means the cost of capital, we also need to know future cash flows. The key in capital budgeting is that we focus on cash flows and not profits. And the required return should reflect the risk of the project. And for most of the time, that will be the weighted average cost of capital. It is not always, so we need to take that into account. Um, the rule of thumb is the, the cost of capital that you use, the discount rate that you use, should always match the risk of the cash flow. There are a number of methods. Uh, the most again, this is a very brief highlight, and we assume that you have prior experiences with that. If you don't have prior experience with this uh, capital budgeting methods, please go, uh, please study the textbook, which go over the explanation in a lot more details. So just a brief review for the net present value method. Uh, we will accept a project if the net present value is greater than or equal to zero. So it's very important to emphasize that having a net present value exactly equal to zero means that the project is breaking even at a net present value sense. And that means that the investor and the entrepreneur is earning her required return on her equity. And this is very important. So if you have a zero net present value, it does not mean that the investor is not earning any return. In fact, a net present value of zero means that the investor or the entrepreneur in this case earns exactly her required return, her cost of uh, equity. For the internal real return method, um, we'll accept the project if the internal rate of return is greater than or equal to the required return. So again, the required return here should, re should reflect the risk. Uh, for, for the profitability index method, the cutoff is for the profitability index to be greater than or equals to one. For the payback method, the owner will set the pay, uh, the requirement. And a lot of times this is, can be an important consideration for an entrepreneur. Remember that an entrepreneur is forced to uh, be under diversified and is taking on um, a majority of the risk in the investment. Uh, for projects that has no end days, um, Forecasting future cash flows can be challenging. So if project uh, and if you are starting a business, oftentimes you may not have an end day. You hope that the business will go on forever. In that case, we need to be able to capture um, the future value of the project. And what we do is we create something called a terminal value. We estimate cash flow for as many time periods as is as feasible. And typically that will be between three to five years. And then we ask, so let's say we estimate cash flow for five years. Then we the, the to capture all the cash flows beyond year five, we will estimate a terminal value at year five. And to do that, we take the cash flow in year six. So t plus one, if t is five, then t plus one will be cash flow in year six. And we divide that by the difference between the required return and the, t and the terminal growth rate for the cash flows. So you may recognize this as the um, growing perpetuity formula. Finally, you want to take into account whether or not you are evaluating independent project versus mutually exclusive projects. If you are e evaluating independent projects, you can simply use this cutoff that we have recommended here to determine if you should accept or reject the project. If you are working with mutually exclusive projects, then you need to rank the projects uh, in terms of their desirability. So again, you will rank them depending on the method that you choose. If you use the net present value method, then you will rank them according to MPV and choose the projects that has the highest net present value. A word of caution, when you're working with mutually exclusive projects, uh, there may be conflicts between the various methods. And if there is ever in doubt, then you should, you should use the net present value method as your deciding um, uh, criteria. Uh, however, it's oftentimes very useful to include alternative method um, to support your analysis. And finally, to put all this into practice, we're going to use an extensive model uh, for um, the company Tasty Taco. We're going to compute um, the cost of equity, the weighted average cost of capital, and also um, the net present value for the business.
See you soon.